Is there a link between art and AI investing? I take a look at two paintings. One is made by a human and the other by a machine. I love doing watercolour paintings and um, each one of those paintings took me anywhere between 5 to 10 hours to paint them. Meanwhile, when you go onto DALI, which is, uh, which is the um, image generative AI that OpenAI has, um, I, it took me only about five minutes to produce um, very similar quality AI generated watercolour cups. So just imagine that if we were to use that speed and, and employ it to investments, just how much more data and how much faster we'd be able to react compared to a human fund manager. Ong Ai Ling has experience in both worlds. She spends her free time painting. She also leads a team that works with artificial intelligence or AI to construct and optimize investment portfolios. The team, together with Nomura Asset Management, recently launched Singapore's first active ETF. It's also Singapore's first ETF powered by AI. The fund invests in Japanese equities and is listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange. For a single human to cover a stock, right, they'll have to take into account quite a lot of different factors. Whereas our AI is able to do, our proprietary models are able to handle more than 200 plus um, factors or important features about a company. And that is on a daily basis. And the analysts may have had a bad day at work and then they wouldn't necessarily produce the same quality of, of work. And you know, it, it, to, hire, to cover a thousand companies, you'd need at least 20 to maybe even 40 or 50 analysts. And not all of them are going to have a really very consistent output. We make rule of thumb judgments about things, but AI doesn't do that. What I hear you say about the use of AI here is that it's a lot more efficient. The data, the quality of that data is going to be stronger, more robust, right? Mm -hmm. At what point, though, might a human step in and be involved? So we have a, what we call a human in the loop process. We've set certain risk parameters that we're comfortable with and we will constantly review that as the time goes on. So in that sense, there's human oversight. We don't just let the model run wild. It's still down to the human to then taper it versus um, the risk that we might or might not want to take. What we really want to know, Eileen, is, is there something specifically that a human being mm -hmm. can do in this sphere that AI simply can't? At one point in 2022, um, when Xi Jinping ch changed, his, uh, changed his policy about COVID, the AI model was caught a bit wrong-footed, right? It didn't think that Xi Jinping would make an about turn. But then having said that, most of the market was also caught out. So I guess if you had a human with a lot of imagination who could imagine something almost impossible, then you know, the human could do better than the AI in that particular instance. With or without the use of AI, overall demand for active ETFs has been on the rise. Assets under management, or AUM, for active ETFs in the Asia-Pacific have recorded a five-year annualized growth of 27%. If you look since the end of 2017, the amount of active ETFs that are actually available on the global market have actually grown fivefold and they now constitute around 7% of the global assets under management that are in ETF assets. So globally, ETF assets are around 10 trillion US dollars, and these are really gaining a lot of traction across the world, particularly here in Asia at the moment as well. Active ETFs are designed to outperform a benchmark. This differs from passive ETFs, which tend to track a particular benchmark. Active ETF, there will be more transactions more trading uh, because the fund manager will have their own stock selection. So this is opposed to um, the passive ETF whereby the rebalancing is done on a less frequent basis, probably six months or once a year. On the downside for active ETF, is, it, it depends on the ETF manager consistency to outperform the, the market because uh, it is not easy to constantly outperform a, a market uh, over a long duration of time. There is also a difference in fees. So for passive ETF, the fund manager aims to outperform the benchmark. As compared to passive ETF, basically it will just replicate um, the returns of the underlying index. So performance uh, is one. Um, second is the fees. So for active ETF, the fees are actually generally higher as compared to passive ETF. 
reason being, you know, more human capital, uh, more technology, more work is being done to create this, you know, ETF to try to outperform the benchmark index. Passive ETF will have lower expense ratio um, and man management fees, right? So the total expense ratio typically range around 0.1 to 0.3%. Whereas for active ETF, it can actually uh, you know, go on a higher range, like 0.5 to 1%. Having said that, uh, mutual funds also do active management, and hence the expense ratio for active uh, funds right, is also on the high side. It can typically range around 1 to 2% uh, for a fund. In the investment world, products which aim for higher returns often come with higher risks. And this is the case for active ETFs as well. So investors do have to be mindful, of course, where in the world this ETF is investing. Is there currency risk involved with it? Are they aware and understand the fundamentals of the country that these active ETFs might be investing in? And then, of course, they can be spread over different types of asset classes as well. So it could be fixed income, it can be commodities, it can be equities, currencies, and so forth. So investors really have to be aware just like they are of any, when it comes to any time they are internationally investing, what those key cross-border risks are. The use of AI in investing is another added layer of risk that investors need to be aware of. Globally, there's been a lot of attention in ChatGPT, but at the same time they realise you can't take every single output result as verbatim. And we've, we've seen this as well in medical uh, testing as well. Advanced testing can sometimes generate some false positives. How exactly is this AI? How exactly is this more efficient than, than, the, uh, than the normal traditional way of investing? I think it's imperative that investors understand this process and therefore can better understand the risks as well. <laughs>